Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Welcome to the inaugural Singapore Energy Lecture. We are most honoured and privileged to have Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew to address us this afternoon. The Minister Mentor is well known to every one of you, and so it is very difficult for me to add to your knowledge of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. But I cannot resist this opportunity to share a few moments with you on the particularly remarkable introduction of Mr. Lee, which I personally observe. In 1995, when Mr. Lee was visiting Israel, he was introduced by the then Foreign Minister, Shimon Peres, at a keynote event. All of us in the audience wonder how Mr. Shimon Peres, who is a well-known orator and statesman, would introduce Mr. Lee. I recall that there was a provision of several minutes for Mr. Shimon Peres to give his introductory remarks. But in his usual brilliant way, he said, and I quote, looking at Mr. Lee, Mr. Shimon Peres said, you have all come to listen to a legend, and I now present to you the legend in person. <laughs> After that, Mr. Shimon Peres gestured Mr. Lee to the rostrum, and that was all. And now, may I invite Minister Mentor to give us some opening remarks before we commence the dialogue session. MM, please. Thank you for gathering today to discuss the question of energy in Singapore. <clears throat> we are a small island, uh, densely populated. So when I faced the prospect of becoming an independent nation <clears throat> in 1965, making a viable economy and a society out of this little piece of land with then about two million people. <clears throat> I had to envision the kind of ways we could go forward. And of course, the immediate example was Hong Kong, densely populated buildings close to each other. It was uh, just tarmac, concrete, tall buildings, and choke full of people. Not the kind of city which I think I wanted to live in. And not the kind of city which Singapore could become and survive because in Hong Kong, you just have to do business there because it's the gateway to China. China was blocked out from the world. And like it or not, pollution or otherwise, you are there. But in Singapore, <coughs> there's no reason for you to be here. So to distinguish ourselves from other cities in the neighborhood, <coughs> my intention was to create a first world oasis in a third world region. And I coined the slogan, Clean and Green Singapore. This was way back in 65, before the, finite, before the energy crisis in 1973. Uh, in this little island, we got to keep pollution down because there's no way to say these are high quality areas, that's low quality areas. If you pollute one part of Singapore, you have polluted the whole of it. And we had enormous troubles when they put up a petrochemical plant in Jurong with Sumitomo. Sumitomo wanted Japanese standards. We wanted benchmarked against the world's best because otherwise, yes, we've got a petrochemical industry, but I remember Kaohsiung in Taipei and you're smelling uh, sulfur dioxide and all of the other fuels. So we set out 
to be clean and green. In 73, with the oil crisis, when oil quadrupled from $2 to $8, and then again and again, we watched the Japanese, how they controlled the air conditioners, uh, not above, not below 25 degrees Celsius in summer. Uh, and they learned to cut per unit cost of, per unit per produ production of the electricity per product. Unfortunately, we are not as well trained and disciplined as the Japanese who will never achieve their standards. But we watched them, their buildings, uh, the way they try to cut off uh, thermal heat from warming up the buildings and so on. We tried to emulate them. And in fact, I got the productivity, the chairman of the productivity center, a man called Mr. Gotto, to come here and explain to us how he does it. But we never reached their standards. Today, we are confronted with something much more serious. Then we were only worried about costs. Now we are concerned about the consequences of CO2 emissions and climate change. Uh, we can try and be the greenest city in the world. We're <laughs> not going to make any difference to the outcome. So, What's the point of it? Well, the point is that if we don't do this, we we'll lose our status as a clean, green city, and we we'll lose our business, and we we'll lose our extra premium for being an unusual city. What's the future? No. We use about 100,000 barrels of oil a day. We are refining 1.3, 1.4 billion barrels every day, but that's for export. Uh, we are a refueling center for tankers and container ships and so on. So our carbon footprint is very high per capita. But if you take just what we consume in Singapore, it's very low. The problem that the world faces is that China and, Japan and India want to achieve what they think they have missed in life. The quality and standards of life, of living, which Japan, Europe, and especially the Americans have reached. 